Hi, and welcome to CFO Perspectives, Maximizing Growth with Recurring Revenue, the roundtable panel brought to you by the Controllers Council. My name is Neil Brown, Executive Director of the Controllers Council. And before I introduce our expert panelists and our partner sponsor, let me share some brief housekeeping items. We'll have Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please use your GoToWebinar panel to ask our experts questions. Next, this webinar is CPE eligible with four polling questions. So please answer three or four polls for CPE or to benchmark your peers. Please allow up to one week for CPE certificates. Also regarding CPE, please stay on the webcast for at least 50 minutes and you'll receive a brief survey directly after the webcast today, so please complete. Finally, you'll receive a link to this webcast via email in the next 24 hours, so no need for notes or screenshots. So with that, I'd like to say a word about our partner and sponsor, Billing Platform. Billing Platform empowers businesses with innovative software solutions to optimize revenue generation through every stage of the customer lifecycle powering growth through operational agility, along with frictionless customer experience. Our industry-leading cloud-based platform is leveraged by global enterprises to optimize the customer journey from idea to revenue. With global customers across multiple industries, billing platform processes billions of trans transactions and dollars every year enabling enterprises to grow revenue, reduce costs, and improve overall customer experience. To learn more, visit billingplatform.com. With that, I'd like to introduce our expert panelists, Brad Sawaya, CFO of Productive, and Matt Ream, Director of Product Marketing. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks, Neil. Um, thanks to the Controllers Council for having us today. Uh, my name, uh, like Neil said, is Matt Rehm. I'm a Product Marketing Director here at Billing Platform, and we're looking forward to sharing our thoughts and insights with you. Um, so let's, uh, let me go ahead and turn it over to Brad for his brief introduction. He's the, uh, the real star of the show today, our CFO. <laughs> thanks, Matt. Thanks, Neil, for having us. Really appreciate it. It's been excited to see, exciting to see the Controllership Council grow and expand as it has. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity to present here today. Um, especially for me, I've had uh, my career, I've spent a good amount of my time in the controllership groups. And so the controllership topics are near and dear to me. And we're hoping today that we can share a bit of information that would be applicable to to all of you joining um, whether you are coming from a traditional company that's considering introducing recurring revenues or if you are currently working for a SaaS company and always have and are looking to see how you can continue to scale and optimize your ecosystem well uh, hopefully uh, everybody can walk away today with a little bit of takeaways on uh, what they can do to better improve their processes and systems and, and therefore further for progress their careers. Great. Uh, today we're going to explore ways that you can unlock the full potential of recurring revenue models to drive growth within your organization. Uh, we're going to cover the challenges posed by having outdated financial systems and we'll try to provide some really practical strategies for you to use in overcoming those barriers. Uh, with recurring revenue becoming such a key driver for growth these days, it's so critical for businesses to adopt um, billing solutions that can keep up with those evolving needs. So we're going to share insights on how to maximize uh, your revenue potential, reduce operational inefficiencies, and set your company up for sustainable success. So I know that uh, Neil gave a brief introduction. It sounded like a lot of, uh, you know, marketing words. So that probably is something we sent him. Um, but, you know, just the short version here is Billing Platform is a, a single solution that can manage the entire revenue lifecycle for companies, honestly, for companies that sell stuff, right? Um, so whether that's subscriptions or, you know, even one time, but we really shine uh, the more complex those transactions get. So usage-based, consumption-based, tiered pricing, high volumes, 
any of those kinds of things is where we can really uh, bring benefit and ROI to your business. We cover the entire quote to cash process. Um, of course, we're especially strong in billing. You may have noticed that in our name um, and revenue recognition as well, not in our name because that would have been um, too awkward to put in, but it is a huge part of our solution. Um, if you wanna learn more about what we do, like uh, Neil said, you can visit the website. You can also check the uh, major analyst reports. Gartner just put out their first magic quadrant for this space, which is called recurring billing applications. Um, but Forrester Way, Ventana, MGI, all these uh, major analysts that cover our space, um, if you want to learn more about us, please see what they say uh, about us. Um, and then just to hit the CPE credit, we do have learning objectives. We want you to be able to identify the challenges the companies have, uh, analyze the impact that a, a modern billing solution might have um, against those challenges, apply strategies to optimize your processes, um, and develop your own action plan to modernize your systems. Um, this recurring revenue is really the reason uh, for billing platforms existence. Our founders saw an opportunity to create something um, that would help companies enter this new stage of commerce, right? Um, we've seen this shift in customer behavior over the last decade or two um, that just continues to gain momentum. These are just a couple of the indica indicators that we've seen. There's tons of studies that are out there that have various numbers, but I think most uh, most sources agree that the uh, the market, the sub global subscription market is growing. Um, this particular stat shows it more than doubling. Um, it's a 16% kegger. Um, you know, tons of growth here, and these are these are not small numbers. Um, customer preference, you know, we we see some people saying, I, I don't know, I've got a friend that uh, has always said, I hate subscriptions. Why does everything have to be a subscription? Well, he's in the 30% that doesn't prefer subscriptions, but um, a lot of consumers do. Um, subscriptions and usage-based payments um, as people want to use things. Investment. Um, so these are just a couple of the studies. There's others that show um, you know, even, you know, five, five to 10 X growth for subscription companies over non-subscription. So um, with that, we just want to level set with our first poll and see what kinds of recurring revenue models your company's already using, just uh, so we get an idea of, of what we're, we're talking about here. So let's go ahead and bring up poll number one. We're getting close all voting here, so let's take a look at the results. Okay, well, that's uh, that's interesting. A lot of people are already using recurring revenue models. That's great. Brad, any thoughts on this? Yeah, it's it, like you said, Matt, it's interesting to see not only consumers buying behavior change, but also in B2B settings as businesses are shifting consume services and, and software and even other goods on a recurring or a subscription basis that maybe some of the SLA agreements that we see at the bottom. All right, uh, let's go back to the slides. Uh, if you can go to the next one. Um, we're just gonna talk for a couple minutes here. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Brad. Brad, why don't you dive a little deeper into the reasoning behind recurring revenue models and uh, just review some of the key benefits. Sure, so certainly from my standpoint, one of the key benefits of a recurring revenue model stream is higher valuations, um, both for public companies and private companies. We've seen that for the past several years. Uh, in fact, even there's could be discrepancies in recurring revenue businesses, those that are flat rate subscriptions versus a usage-based component. Um, those usage-based uh, revenue 
companies are even getting an additional premium on top of the even uh, normal recurring revenue, which that discrepancy has kind of come down a little bit lately, but it's still there. So the the quality of revenue, um, you know, the, the reasons for those higher valuations kind of go across many different categories, certainly a predictable revenue stream. Once you have recurring revenue, it's a situation where you don't have to execute uh, a new transaction every single time with uh, either an existing or new customer, but you have a continuous relationship with that customer, which yields to a, a more predictable revenue stream, uh, especially for those companies that sell long-term contracts. That predictable revenue stream can in turn uh, help you better forecast the rest of the business. So you kind of get a, a more accurate forecasting and predictability in the overall economics of the business. Um, this also can uh, yield steadier cash flows as you have customers paying you on a recurring basis and you're better able to predict those cash flows from existing contracts. Improved customer retention. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation, how you now have a continuous relationship with the customer, which allows you to do more things in customer success. Um, and then a, a higher customer lifetime value. Like while sometimes uh, or many times in these business models, there is an investment in place to acquire the customer, even if it's an SMB or a, a shorter term subscription, usually there's an investment period of at least a couple of months to acquire that customer. Um, the lifetime value of the customer uh, it proves to be more valuable than in transactional businesses where you get that customer for a long term um, and whatever that ex estimated lifetime is after that first investment period of investing in sales and marketing to acquire the customer, uh, which could be months or it could be um, perhaps longer, um, but the, the longer the, the, the lifetime value of that customer quickly pays back those acquiring costs and then the rest is um, very high margins that you get in profitability per customer. We want to go to the next slide. Matt, do you want to touch on the different types? I know we hit this in the first polling question, but this is our perspective as well. Yeah, so just to, just to level set on what we're talking about with uh, recurring revenue models, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, you guys, uh, based on the poll, are already familiar with most of these, but, um, you know, these are the ones that we see most often with our own uh, customer base and our prospects. So um, subscription, obviously, that can be a monthly, um, you know, often a, a standard amount per month, things like uh, Netflix, um, uh, HubSpot for the marketing, things like that. Um, Usage-based, uh, we're seeing becoming more common. You pay for what you use, things like uh, Amazon Web Services, um, some mobile phone planes are like that, uh, if they're not an all-inclusive. Um, and some things like Stripe and PayPal, where you, you're paying um, you know, with each transaction. Uh, freemium, I saw that as a zero on the, uh, on the that you can use for free, but then pay for extra features like um, LinkedIn, where you pay for the, or you get the basic plan for free and pay uh, for premium um, to get additional features and functions. Um, there's a lot of uh, productivity tools, project management tools, things that are like that, you know, to get you get you hooked. So that's a, it's very common. I think um, consumers love that one, um, and businesses too, because you can get people in there. It's often the product-led uh, go to go to market model, um, which can be very effective. Um, memberships, um, things like you know that you pay to belong to professional organizations. Um, and then the service level agreement ones that uh, I think 60 some percent of people are already involved in. We see that with uh, data centers or IT things, a lot of the high tech stuff, customer support uh, companies, things like that. So um, that actually brings us to poll number two. We are making great progress here. So let's take our second poll. And wh what we're interested in, um, the ERP obviously is such a foundational piece of the financial tech stack. Uh, just curious what you are using. Is it is it on-prem? Is it hosted in the cloud? 
some hybrid. I'm I'm guessing there's going to be. Uh, my money's on hybrid, actually. <laughs> if, I can, if I can put that out there, what do you think, Brad? I think the bigger enterprises, you're still going to see uh, a hybrid of, of folks that have multiple ERPs, some of which the legacies are still on prem. I think some of us are always surprised to see how much of that is still out there. Um, uh, but for the big enterprises, that's certainly the case. For uh, mid-sized or smaller enterprises, that is not always the case. Um, and we might more closely. Oh, all right. There you go, cloud hosted. Oh, yeah. All right, let's um, let's move on. Brad, um, let me ask you this. What are some of the uh, challenges, the obstacles that we're seeing to companies that want to maximize their revenue by adopting recurring revenue models? Sure. So when we think about any type of processes, especially in accounting, there's people, processes, and systems. So to start with people and cultural and team challenges, this can be particularly cute for traditional companies that have been doing things in a certain way forever. And so um, introducing recurring revenue, it's, it's a completely different business model. And therefore, the changes uh, impact almost each department. Um, going from selling widgets, where once the sales team executes the sell, the shipping team ships the widget, um, and the billing team bills for it and then accounts for it. It's, it's that ship it and forget it model that is no longer works. Now you have that continuous engagement ongoing with the customer. That could mean that you need to introduce customer success uh, and have an ongoing relationship, multiple touch points, perhaps multiple QBRs, quarterly business reviews with those customers to assess how they are feeling about their current subscription and making sure they're getting the value that they are expecting from their ongoing relationship. <laughs> Other organizational adapt adaptions could be sales and commission structures. Uh, in my prior life, I was in a situation where the sales team was used to selling million, million dollar plus big ticket items um, that was that ship it and forget it model. And the, that enterprise was struggling to introduce a recurring revenue stream and specifically to motivate the sales team because they're going from selling that big ticket one time item and their commission structure all based on that to now having to sell a couple hundred thousand dollar subscription. That subscription piece needs to be commissioned differently and the sales team needs to understand that. Um, some of which kind of get it and, and are able to easily m migrate into the new mode and, and some not so much. Um, and that's what the skills and processes. Training certainly can help, uh, but change is hard. And um, you know, we, we need to be, we in controller, controllership, the, the big thing that I would, you know, let's make sure that we're not the bottlenecks. Like we are the ones that it's this can be challenging, but we, especially because we have our regular cadence, our month-to-month -month close activities that we need to do quarterly close, annual close, getting through an audit that doesn't really leave a lot of time on the calendar and capacity to uh, accept and be involved in these changes. But to the extent that that we can, it's certainly the value add, and a lot of these recurring revenue streams are the future for these enterprises, and so. If we can be a catalyst for that change and not a bottleneck, that can certainly help uh, help ourselves. Then, if we want to go to the next slide, um, just the the business business challenges, just broadly kind of turn business challenges here. A uh, pricing strategy is uh, a, a challenge as you're trying to think about how to go to market with a new re recurring revenue stream. As Matt described earlier, there are multiple different uh, options for both consumer offerings and B2B offerings. You know, what works best for you? How can you drive the most value to your organization? Which pricing strategy will work? You know, one quick note here, I, I will say is rarely do we see 
our customers get this right the very first time. There's always an evolution that happens. They'll go to market with pricing um, and with these recurring revenue streams, one thing that can help is the ability and the need to, to change. And so they'll, they'll try certain pricing SKUs and over time, perhaps months or, or years, change and evolve those, tweak those, uh, change to different uh, consumption patterns. Um, those all can help you zero in on what we call here the Goldilocks price. Like what is the optimum price to drive the most value to your enterprise? Uh, billing complexities. If you are, if you're back to that ship it and forget it example, if that's what your ecosystem is set up to do, which for traditional companies, that's how it's worked. Billing has always sat in the ERP. Um, I was in a situation again in a prior life where there I, we were in a traditional business model and there was a business unit who had developed um, a kind of a side offering, a side software offering to help their customers better maintain the big machines that they had purchased through software. And this was a one-off situation that they had done for one big customer and it was working really, really well. They wanted to go to market with the rest of their customer base. And so they kicked the product team, kicked off those discussions, uh, went to the controllership team and said, okay, this is the new business model that we're going to go to market with. We need to be able to bill for this and the ERP could not do it. And so, or or it, at least the way it was currently set up with the customizations of the on-prem ERP, it just didn't work. So, you know, certainly back then, the controllership team submitted a ticket to IT as IT owned the infrastructure to make those changes and enable that new pricing, new billing model and sure enough, the answer was, yeah, maybe the ERP could do it, but that's gonna take uh, a lot of customization, uh, like, like to the tune of nearly a million dollars, and it would take a year to implement. Well, that, that billing complexity that comes from recurring revenue stream, that, that doesn't work. That's not an agile way to go to business, to go to market, to shift uh, with the new market demands. And so the billing complexities, and this kind of gets into the next point of system uh, bottlenecks, but those, that's, that's the reason why we list billing complexities here is because that's a business decision that has downstream implications. A customer churn. Now, this is one that's kind of interesting. Certainly businesses, recurring revenue businesses, the, we, we talked about the predictable revenue, which is fantastic. But one thing to be conscious of is churn and is the as long as the business is growing and scaling then this is usually not an issue assuming there's no product problems customer churn can be kept at lower levels but if the the growth of the business starts to taper off um then and and as your customer base grows the churn will grow with the customer base and sometimes what you'll see is some of these businesses will reach a certain point in time where the churn starts to exceed their growth, which can, which can cause uh, um, kind of damage to the enterprise. If we go to the next slide, um, legacy systems can hinder growth. So I, I already gave the example of the on-prem ERP and custom code. This is a, this is a, a very real bottleneck. Um, the custom code is very expensive to maintain. Um, having developers on staff to make any changes that are needed in recurring revenue and maintain uh, everything to be up and compliant um, is very expensive and it's a bottleneck. Um, the, the other things that, that we'll see is you know, the manual workarounds and a combination of customizations and manual workarounds. You uh, were, were I, I'm not surprised anymore, but it's, it took some time. Uh, I think most of us would be shocked at how many big enterprises still run much of their quote to cash offerings uh, in manual spreadsheets. Now, um, I, I wanna pause here and, and be clear. We are obviously all for automation. You can automate everything 
that um, you can and, and we should. Um, there will always be manual things. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily advocating here. Um, sometimes you'll hear the notion of like a push, put, push button close and you, know, you can have your books completely closed on day one. I have yet to see that. Uh, I love the aspiration and, and we should all strive for improvement. Um, but the, um, my, the point I'm making here is that there will always be a custom contract. There will always be something unique that requires manual intervention. And your, your, although we're advocating for automation, your ecosystem will need to be able to handle those manual interventions. Um, anyway, so, so when you have this ecosystem and, and legacy systems, it can certainly limit your scalability and agility. Um, the, the one thing that, I, for those that are currently working for SaaS companies and are thinking about scale, some of these things that we've described today may not be familiar to you with on-prem ERPs and things like that, but as, as you think about your current ecosystem, you probably have uh, a lot of out-of-the-box offerings. And what I mean by that is systems that when you are a very small company, perhaps even before you joined, the, the teams, as they went to market with their offering, they signed up for some very simple systems in their quote to cash ecosystem that allowed them to charge their customers and collect from their customers. And those systems have worked just fine up until a certain point. And maybe you're there now, maybe you're not, but where those systems start to fall down, those systems as you grow and scale as a company, um, this happened to me in a prior situation where we had a system that we were using um, plus uh, some manual intervention and custom code on the product side allowed us to grow and scale the company to say 50 million. But once we reached that stage, as we continued to grow internationally, you the, that system started to fall down and we became non-compliant. And you, you might be able to be non-compliant and fly under the radar for a certain time period, but but that will catch up to you. You know, as long as you continue to grow and scale, you will need to be compliant, certainly uh, domestically and internationally, whether that be through sales tax or e-invoicing or other payment compliant reasons um, where you may need to upgrade your ecosystem to more of an enterprise grade product that allows you to continue to grow and scale so it doesn't turn into a bottleneck. Um, we've seen this with some of the fastest growing companies over the past couple of years, where they literally cannot grow and scale any further. They cannot execute new deals without a significant amount of manual intervention to the point where it starts to cripple their business. Um, I think with that, Matt, should we go to polling question number three? Yeah, let's go ahead and put up number three. Uh, we're just interested in getting an idea um, from those online where your where your billing actually happens for you today. Take a few more seconds to answer, and we'll close it out. All right, a lot of people still using ERPs, which you know I think is is fairly normal, right? A lot of people are still billing with the ERP, um, and then multiple. Sure. That's what we see a lot of too. Is multiple? We should have put an option for a homegrown system and the programmer retired. That's always a good one. <laughs> Yeah, that, that tribal knowledge that they took yeah. with them. Oh, it's, it's, it's real and it's scary. <laughs> so, um, Brad, let's, let's start to look a little more forward now and talk about how, you know, as a, a CFO, you might approach a change moving from legacy systems into a more modernized infrastructure. Sure. Uh, sure. And, and for, for all the folks here, leading their finance departments and, and or working in controllership. This will look familiar, you know, the order to cash ecosystem going here from left to right, starting with leads, 
great opportunities. Quoting, you also hear it in terms of CPQ, um, billing, and what we mean by that here in this context is doing any calculations that are needed to actually generate the charge. And then invoicing, that can come uh, in conjunction with the payment processing. Those payments could be applied automatically if it is, if they happen at the same time, or if it's uh, an invoice that's sent out and, and traditional payments, you have accounts receivable and collections that collect on that and then revenue recognition and then the general ledger. So this, this going left to right, very common. Uh, every company generally has most of these components. Um, and then in the middle, you'll, you'll see sometimes what we end up with is kind of a spaghetti bowl of, of, of processes and system flows that cause the bottlenecks that we previously talked about. You know, manual swivel chairs, manual intervention, um, different checkpoints that need to happen along the way that makes this ecosystem, especially in recurring revenue streams, uh, challenging and uh, kind of the problems that, that we often see with our customer base that need to be addressed. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, a little bit more of a, a modern enterprise approach um, will be if if you have your, your front office, you still have your leads and opportunities. Now, many of these tools are already cloud-based. You know, Salesforce was certainly the front runner uh, in, in enterprise cloud applications. And so that sales and marketing teams, I, I think generally have been used to acquiring uh, cloud-based solutions to help them optimize their jobs and with the leads and the opportunities. And then all the way to the right, the general ledger and the ERP, um, this is, we're, we're seeing a lot of disruption in this space right now as the traditional ERPs have been uh, attempting or trying to upgrade to cloud, to, to a cloud offering. And with that cloud offering um, has come with limited uh, potential or limited functionality. Um, and that, that was not present in the on-prem ERPs, but um, the on-prem ERPs, it was all custom software anyway, which was had, had its own uh, bunch of problems. So here in the middle, you have so you sometimes referred to as the middle office. But what I, I like to focus on here is of all the duties in controllership, of all the the different processes um, that that come up to uh, producing financial statements and the financial health of the business, this is the most important um, because this is where you are intersecting with the customers. So uh, in the past, I think accounting and controllership has been a, kind of that back office operation. You know, think of the accountants in the back room, you know, kind of with the green visor, that visualization uh, still cracks me up. Um, but nowadays, the in, in these recurring revenue streams, Downstream controllership has now been pulled up upstream to where there's a strong connection to not only the front office in helping the team sell recurring revenue, uh, but also with the product itself. So that's what we have on the bottom. And that's what we mean by the usage feeds is that you now need to be able to link your ecosystem to your product. And your product needs to be able to communicate downstream, or in this case, into this, this middle layer, um, the different usage components that are associated with each transaction. Now, that, that's the case whether you're selling flat rate subscriptions, certainly usage-based subscriptions, that's obvious. Um, if there's any fee calculations that's in place, the customer usage is there. But, but again, that flat rate subscriptions nearly always those flat rate subscriptions come with a certain set of entitlements. And so those entitlements need to be tracked. And that's what's fed into the usage and that's what makes this so different. In, and, and I wanna emphasize here, this is a great opportunity for controllership departments because now you are interfacing with the product team and your customers more so than we have in the past, which, which just adds value to you and your role especially if we set up the ecosystem in a way that can handle change. Um, 
Matt, maybe we we can uh, move on to this to the next slide here. Yeah, let's let's talk about some of the the benefits, um, especially from your perspective as CFO, right? What what benefits are you seeing um, as companies move their financial processes to something that's more modern? Yeah, so so certainly as as the role of the CFO, you know, our job is to work with the senior management team of the other departments, you know, with our board, with our investors. Um, but we also need to make sure that our house is in order, right? So, so as I mentioned before, we need to make sure that our own, our own teams aren't uh, certainly not a, not a bottleneck to changes that need to happen or scale that needs to come into place, but we're, we're actually driving value to the enterprise that we uh, as, as the leaders of our organization and our teams uh, can drive value to the rest of the enterprise. And that is making sure that we set up this ecosystem in an agile way that can be it, it can it can really be strategically uh, a strategic differentiator compared to your competitors if you can set this up in a way and be have the flexibility to to change and adapt to your customer needs that can be you in controllership making a direct impact um, on a higher valuation of your company. Um, and then certainly data-driven decision making. Um, this is something that we've we've talked about. I mean, I mean, you, you'll hear talk about all the time. Certainly AI. Um, we're not going to focus on this today, although it's a great topic. I think it's it's here to stay. Um, not only for for how your companies are using AI to better serve your customers, but how you can consume can can use different AI tools to do your job better. And the point that I want to emphasize is that, again, going back to the customer data, like in, in these the ecosystem map that we described in the slide before, you and controllership have access to your customer's usage data. That is extremely valuable. Understanding that, understanding how you can feed that into AI and big language models, where you can better leverage that to provide better insights to your enterprise, whether it be with AI or even just with BI tools, that can be really, really valuable. Um, the last thing that I don't want to forget to mention here is, Matt, you asked, is, is the leader of, of a finance department, what concerns you? And I would say uh, M&A is always a topic uh, of consideration for, for your teams. And it, whether that be if you are acquiring companies, if you're an acquisitive company and you have many other enterprises or businesses that you're bringing into your fold, you, you can leave them standalone for a certain time, but eventually, especially if you share joint customers across different business units, you wanna present a unified customer experience. So you're going to need to consolidate those systems to provide a unified front. And so you want your ecosystem to be able to handle things that you might not be doing today. Um, so that's one consideration. And then on the other side is if you might potentially get acquired, something to think about for you and your controllership departments is to say, hey, if I get acquired, what will that mean? I will likely need to connect up to the parent company's general ledger. And if you have your ecosystem set up in a way that's advantageous for you to be able to unplug from your GL. Maybe it's QuickBooks, maybe it's um, an, another kind of mid-tier cloud software. Um, but if you can unplug that and plug that in uh, to the parent company's ERP in a way that doesn't disrupt the customer experience, well, that can be extremely beneficial for your for your for your team that's value add and when you think about life post acquisition and the kind of value you can drive to the new enterprise and set yourself up for success that 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 becomes really really interesting and again strategically advantageous yeah great point um let's let's go to the next slide i want to get into some of the really practical elements here um that we that we want to cover um, here's just kind of a, a simple checklist of steps um, for companies that want to transition to, to modern systems. So the first one, obviously, you've got to know where you are and where you want to be and identify the gap there. You know, this this uh, we've got a, a tool that we've developed that I'm excited to tell you about later if we get there. 
Um, but you know, this involves conducting an audit of your processes and systems, identifying pain points, inefficiencies, and then prioritizing those areas that are critical. What you know, what will help best support the revenue strategy that you're trying to implement. Um, Brad, you want to talk about these others? Sure. Yeah, and I, I would say this is this is an area we're going to go quickly over this um and I, I i will certainly offer if anybody listening wants to take conversations offline we're more than happy to do so um just run a good process like if you're if you if you have a need and you're realizing your erp can't do it please please do not just go ask your salesforce admin what you should do do your own research matt mentioned the analyst reports at the beginning of the call like, like do your research, run a good process, understand what your requirements are, not only for your current requirements, or potential requirements in the future. Um, and then you can select the right technology, plan and execute it, a, a good implementation, which is gonna take effort and time, but it will pay dividends for, for a long time if you can do it, do it right. I, I, think, I think with Matt, Matt, we should probably kind of move on here. Yeah, let's do. Um, let's get into some of the strategies for optimizing revenue, um, and then um, yeah, we're, why don't you talk about this one, and then we'll. I think we're going to hit our last poll, and then we have a couple more slides. Yeah. So as as you think about how you justify making the leap, how do you justify making the change? You know, I think we described a lot of things where um, is is kind of kind of big macro topics that that the, the leader of your finance department should be very concerned about. But even at, at a lower level, a very practical standpoint, as you think about those justifications, um, think about revenue leakage and um, incorrect billings that go out. This, this happens more often than we'd like to admit. Um, and then scalability. That, that's how you can justify carving out the time in your busy schedule uh, to, to driving, to driving those, those additional dollars um, and margin to your business if if this is done and done in a way that that works well. I think we have our last polling question. I think we do want to hit that, and I realize we're we're being a little quick here, but we do want to leave time for any questions. Um, and for those of you who are here just for the CPE, <laughs> make sure you get this last. This is the last polling question. Yeah, this is um, you know we're we're happy to you know like Brad said answer any questions. Um, you know we're we're not trying to push anything on you neither brad nor i is in sales and um but we we want to share what we do have so if you're interested in learning more um obviously let us know and uh, we're happy to to talk i can't wait to see the results on this one brad it might be okay <laughs> there you go no. hey you know we're nothing if not open and honest about uh things so good um good well you're you've almost earned your cpe credit here so let's let's just talk for a minute about um you know some of the other uh, elements in involved in recurring revenue um brad do you want to do you want to take sure. this one I, I think we kind of touched on this um the, the point being is an enhanced customer experience you get that recurring relationship with the customer you get the constant touch point um and it, which which allows the continuous feedback back to the product itself. Um, you know, a lot of these recurring revenue streams, especially if it's software, they'll they'll be they they have access to the the the, the monthly or quarterly or annual updates that happen on the software. And so, as a customer, they have the opportunity to provide those inputs to help shape what's on the roadmap because um, they're uh, an existing paying customer. Um, so that's just that's just one example. We've we've spent, uh, I think, a good amount of time talking about that in some of the earlier slides. Yep, agree. And, so, and same for this next one, I think, with leveraging data and turning insights into growth. Um, I think, like like we were describing, keep keep this in your mind, right? This this is an important point, uh, and it's it's going to be a big part of the future. Um, if it's not already part of your companies, you know what data points are important to to you in controllership. Um, sometimes we will just focus on 
whatever is needed as inputs to our systems of record, right? As as those just just whatever impacts a financial transaction, um, but we, it can be so much more as we partner with FP&A, as we partner with the product team, and can help uh, leverage the data that we have. Um, in making sure the customers, if it's a usage-based model, billing them correctly on the usage, if it's a flat rate subscription and then there's entitlements associated with that, how much the customer is consuming those entitlements and what pattern recognition we can develop from that data can be really impactful. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's, let's, let's get into this last section. Um, you know, we at Billing Platform, we're in the business of helping companies move on to modern modern platforms and you know whether it's ours or not uh, there's benefits that come from from being on a more modern platform so um, on the next slide I think you know just the point of this one is just you need to ask yourself the right questions right and here's a couple to get you started um, you know I like what Brad brought up earlier about you know systems that can do what you need them to do right now but may not in the future so you know the best time to look at that is probably now, right? Brad, would you suggest maybe look at it now and make plans, or wait until it becomes a problem? Yeah, obviously now. Like it, it, now, some these you know, I know we're in fall now here, but um, before you get into year-end close, um, now is a good time to take a look at the ecosystem. Soon, soon your departments will be coming to you and asking for projections for next year. And so if there's changes that you might need to make uh, next year, now is the time to consider what those are, get them in the budget and or provide input. Like if there's, if your business is getting a little bit of a, a squeeze right now and, and not performing as, as expected and needing to carve out perhaps um, uh, some more profitability, then you can look and see where, where you can find some of that revenue leakage, where you can find efficiencies, where you can cut out perhaps um, some of the maintenance of maintaining custom systems and custom software. Yeah, great point. So based on our work with a lot of companies across a lot of different industries, uh, we put together a resource. Um, it's on the next slide. Um, and we call this the Revenue Lifecycle Maturity Roadmap. Um, and what this is, is um, it's, a, it's a resource that we have on our website. It's not gated. We're not, we're not trying to um, you know, trick you into anything. Um, but we found that that organizing um, organizing it as a maturity model really seems to help people think about this. So I just want to talk about this this diagram for a minute that kind of captures all the different pieces. You know, that top layer, there's there's three key things that we've included in here that are important to um, to CFOs. Right, and those are the, the customer experience that we've talked about a few times, operational improvements, mon monetization of emerging business models. So we've we've gone over those, um, and that's you know that's the CFO. So you've got to have those imperatives in place. You've got to have plans for those. You've got to have thoughts around that, um, and then it gets into the practical um, aspects. There's there's specific processes that we focus on. These are things that that a modern um, billing and, and revenue management solution can help you with, um, and I want to talk more about those seven in a minute. And then and then how do you measure it, right? So this tries to present a complete picture, uh, you know, from the strategic um, through you know implementation and then actually measuring success. So uh, what we what we built it's on our website um, under our our white paper resources. Um, we, we've taken these seven um, business processes and we've, we've built out, there's a, a four-step maturity model. Um, there's an ad hoc stage where you're just doing everything manually. There's a structured stage, which has some automation, but, you know, still silos. Coordinated stage, you know, things are more integrated. And then an optimized stage. So the idea, of the, and we've got, you know, some details on what each of those include. The idea behind this is to give you a resource um, so that you can look at, you know, and say, oh, well, you know, for for reporting and controls, we're only in the structured stage. You know, how do we move into coordinated? You know, ultimately, I would assume most companies want to be optimized for all of these processes. But 
um, it just it, we offer it as a helpful resource. It's on our website, um, and like I said, no no obligation necessary for that. Um, I think that um, Brad, this probably brings us to uh, the end of our time. We'll see if there's any questions, but um, we've uh, enjoyed spending this time with you. Hopefully, you've gotten some value out of this. Um, Brad, anything you want to say? Uh, no, yeah, th thank you again. Um, realize we ran a little short on time, so if there's any follow-ups, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, well, we could still uh, take uh, uh, one uh, question here from the audience. Uh, we've got just a couple of minutes. Is uh, Here's a question, is recurring revenue management applicable to small and medium-sized businesses? Question. Um, yeah, I, I would certainly say so. Um, and now, some of those small and medium-sized businesses, maybe they're already a recurring revenue uh, business, but uh, and maybe not. Maybe it's it's still a small business that's transactional. But I would say even the smallest of businesses um, are are considering recurring revenue and seeing what they can do uh, to take advantage of the of the steady revenue stream that we described. Excellent. Uh, here's another question. How will AI affect revenue management? Any uh, ideas on that? Yeah, it, it's a good question. So when we say revenue management, um, that can be a little bit broad. And, and certainly AI has a huge impact of that. How's the sales team executes, how, how you know, chief revenue officers uh, go, go to market with their offerings. Um, if we're talking specifically about revenue recognition, I know sometimes in controllership, that's what we refer to as revenue management. Um, but it, I think there's also a role that it will play. Um, I don't know that it will get to the point where it will completely be, like I said, more of a push button close where um, there's little intervention. Uh, certainly there'll need to be a lot of oversight in place. Um, the biggest thing that I think, and, and we're doing this within our product, is around reporting and how it, this is kind of the simplest form of, I think, how AI can help all of us is uh, leverage, be, being able to get what we want out of our data and out of our systems better and using AI to, to do that and simply do our jobs better. And that's definitely applicable to, to accounting, running reports, understanding the debits and credits and uh, the movements, uh, monthly movements, budget to actuals, all of that I think could be largely impacted and, and benefited from some AI tools. We are getting to the top of the hour, so I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Brad and Matt for your, your thoughtful uh, preparation and uh, excellent uh, information sharing today. Thank you for that. and. Uh, to our partner and sponsor, Bill Billing Platform, who is uh, certainly a, a leader in in this category. So, uh, so thank you for that, and um, and to our audience, uh, thanks for participating today, and great luck to all uh, in 2024 and beyond. Thanks, Neil. Appreciate it. Thanks, Neil. Have a great one, everybody. Take care. Thank you.